Yes, recording is started. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, yes, great. Certainly. So first of all, I would like uh, to thank you for the opportunity that you gave me to present my work today. Uh, the title of my presentation is Performance Evaluation of Next Generation Data Center and HPC Networks with Co-Packaged Optics. And it's more like a use case scenario that we're going to, that I'm going to present today about how you can use Omnet++ and the simulation models uh, in various projects in, uh, in different companies. And for you that, I know that many of you are coming from different backgrounds, so if you are not so familiar with the hardware details or what is Copacaz Optics, I'm going to go also over some details, high level details about the hardware first, uh, so you will be able to follow the presentation. So here you can see an outline of the presentation. First, uh, we're going to see what is uh, the Copacaz Optics technology and why we are interested in it. Uh, next, I'm going to talk briefly about the research project we are currently working. Uh, the name of the project is Motion. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, how can we use Copacaz optics and how much additional bandwidth we can get in, in the network. Uh, then we are going to see how the system architecture is affected. And then I'm going to, to present um, uh, the performance analysis, I'm going to, to give a two-fold approach. And first, I'm going to talk about a network performance analysis we did uh, with Omnest, with a simulator based on Omnest. And then uh, I'm going to give you also a perspective uh, from a more of a cloud operations perspective where we are going to see a job placement analysis with a separate tool and then how we combine these results with Om uh, with Omnist in order to to see the, the difference in the performance uh, so why we are interested in co-packaged optics uh, in this slide here in the graph what you can see is the total io bandwidth that um, uh, we can get from uh, the switch versus time. So this starts uh, from 2010, 12 years back, and goes all the way up to today, 2022. And as you can see here, over um, the span of 12 years, we have a an 80x improvement in the total I.O. bandwidth we can get. Uh, 2010, we had less than one terabps. Uh, per uh, switch, now we are uh, at 51.2 uh, terabps. Now, of course, um, this is this hasn't happened by magic. So what people did uh, over these years, they, they started doubling alternatingly the number of uh, uh, certain lanes at the switch ASICs, or they doubled the data rate per lane between the different generations. So for example, at the very beginning, they had uh, 64 lanes at 10 gigabps, and now we have 52 lanes at uh, 100 gigabps per lane. Uh, of course, there is still demand, especially now with all these AI machine learning applications and these huge clusters uh, with uh, big uh, models. Uh, there's still demand for further bandwidth scaling. And this has opened the way to new ideas and solutions, people are trying to think, okay, how we move uh, forward uh, for the next three generations. So here on the top left, what you can see is a schematic of how we build switches today. Uh, we have the motherboard, um, we have the first level package, and on top of that, we have the switch ASIC. And then we had traces um, uh, through the board, through the motherboard, and we have the optics at the edge. The problem uh, with this approach is that um, uh, we are start getting uh, being a package pin constraint, which means that uh, as we start increasing the size of the ASIC, we have so so a very high number of pins, and we don't have enough space to route them through the first level package. The second problem is the power consumption. We keep adding more and more uh, um, lines, and the thing is that these lengthy wires they consume uh, high energy in order to reach the optics. 
And of course, uh, we have an increase at the cost. Uh, we are at the point that uh, almost 50% of the switch cost is coming from the optics. Now, with the co-packaged optics approach, the promise is that we can have an extra dimension for wiring the chip pins. So, as you can see here, we can have the laser at the edge of the first level package. And now we can have much shorter wires, which means that uh, we need much less uh, energy to drive the optics which uh, can help us reduce the power consumption by 25 to 50%. And of course, it can help us also reduce the cost. Um, the cost savings can reach uh, 50% as well. So what we're doing in the motion research project. Uh, the motion research project is a collaboration between IBM and 2.6 Incorporated, and we are building this co-packaged optics module, you can see in the, um, uh, image here. Uh, here you can see the same module in my hand to get a perspective of the size of the module. And here you can see uh, a demo we have built with four of these co-packaged optics modules uh, surrounding a processor chip in the middle. So uh, we started by building a first generation module. We have 16 channels and uh, NRZ uh, modulation format. Uh, I'm, going, I'm not going to go through all these details. The important numbers is that we have almost one terabps of bandwidth per, uh, per module. And in the second generation, we are going to go to 3.6 terabps per module by increasing the number of channels to 32 and also by moving from NRZ modulation format to PAM4 modulation format. Uh, so the idea is that you can use later this module in order to uh, to place it next to switch ASICs or processors or accelerators, uh, GPUs, and get more bandwidth out of these chips. Um, so now, for more hardware details, you can uh, always refer to our uh, previous published work. We have uh, published details about the packaging, how everything is assembled inside here, the lasers and everything um, regarding the heat spreaders and how we cool this module. And we have also detailed results about the performance of the lasers and the, the receivers. And one of the highlights is that uh, we have um, uh, increased rel reliability through uh, laser sparing, which means that for every laser that we have in the module, we have a backup laser too. So in case that one of the laser fails, um, we have um, a very quick solution where the second laser, the, sp the spare laser is going to be brought up and uh, uh, continue transmitting the data. Uh, now that uh, I gave you an idea of what is the module and where, what we are developing in the project, uh, the next answer that we had to answer was a question that we had to answer is like how much additional bandwidth we can get with these co-packaged optics modules. So in order to give answer to this question, we did a scalability analysis. And for this analysis, we considered different carrier si sizes like 70 by 70, 90 by 90, and 110 by 110 millimeters. And we assumed that we have two switch ASICs and for the remaining area on the package, uh, we assume that we have a fill factor of 40%, which means that we can use 40% of the remaining area to place these uh, optical modules. And the results can be seen here in this graph. Uh, on the uh, y-axis, we have the optical and electrical bandwidth that we can get from the package, which means from both the bottom, uh, uh, which means the, the traditional electrical wires and the top, which is the co-packaged optics modules. And here you can see on the x-axis, the number of uh, these optical modules. So for the 70 by 70 carrier, we can reach uh, all the way up to 50 uh, terabps switches. And if we would like to build 100 terabps switches, we would need uh, to go with a solution uh, with uh, 16 uh, optical modules and the biggest uh, carrier size of 110 by 110 millimeters. Uh, and now let's talk about uh, the system architecture, how the system is going to be affected. So first, what we did, we considered the case uh, from the HPC area. And on top, you can see a network uh, which is inspired from the Summit supercomputer. And what is important uh, to mention about this network is that uh, at the time they built it, they used uh, 36 by 36 switches at 100 uh, gigabps per, uh, per port. 
and in order to connect all the nodes they needed to implement a three-level network so you have the servers in the racks you have the top of rack switches here and on the top you have uh, big boxes that implement two-level networks inside so this is how it works and what we did now we assumed that we have a switch module a next generation switch module uh, with uh, co-packaged objects we assume that we have 152 ports and we have 400 gigabps per, uh, per port now so in order to be to build a system uh, with similar size now now we need only a, a, a much lower number of switches we need 86 percent fewer switches which can result to reduced cost and reduced power consumption at the same time uh, from an operations perspective we have less administration and management overhead it's just much simpler to configure uh, fewer switches and uh, also the network becomes uh, faster we have lower diameter um, the most distant servers they need uh, three hops max instead of uh, five hops and one additional benefit is that uh, we have 4.2 times uh, more servers per first level switch top of rack switch which means that we have uh, improved network locality so with only one uh, hop you can reach let's say 3.5 thousand cores if we assume that we have 48 cores per, uh, per server and the final advantage is that um, uh, because we increase also the link rate and we have the same number of servers we also get uh, four times higher bisection bandwidth in our network uh, a second um, scenario that we considered is coming from the cloud area so for the baseline uh, case we assumed um, a data center network with state-of-the-art switches for the spine we assumed 25.6 terabps switches for the top of uh, the rack switches we assume uh, 6.4 terabps switches and comparing with a solution with co-packaged optics we again see similar improvements now we have the same number of hops between the two different systems but we still have 41 percent fewer switches and two times more servers per first level switch and of course we still have um, the same improvements in the bisection bandwidth four times uh, higher bisection bandwidth and one thing also i would like to highlight between this scenario and the previous one in this scenario we have also a three to one over subscription ratio at the top of rack switches which is the same for both configurations and the reason is that in most cases we we don't need so much money within data center networks like in hpc scenarios i showed previously so in order to reduce cost people the cost people um, go to these oversubscribed solutions uh so of course we have talked only about benefits and benefits where is the cuts what are the drawbacks of um, this approach i i think it's not necessarily a drawback but something that we need to be more careful now with these uh, high radic switches is uh, first is the system availability and second the system security and the reason is that just because we have so many servers connected to a single switch if one switch goes down for example you're going to leave to lose a bigger part of your system more applications will be affected and at the same time if you have a virus in your network uh, or um, other security threats um, even a single switch if it gets compromised you have more servers being affected which means that we need to be more careful we need to apply stricter quality assurance protocol uh, for our systems uh, in order to to avoid uh, uh, being in situations like this and now for the next slide let's let's talk about the network performance and uh, i will start uh, with the simulation setup for our simulations we used a, a rather old system uh, it's uh, it's almost 12 years now uh, the the hpc cluster i used it's called perks and it's um, uh, what is interesting with this system uh, and kind of funny is that this system was the first one that used co-packaged optics so you have different nodes and they are connected with optics and at the time they built this hub solution that you can see here where they attached next to the hub basic um, the co-packaged optics modules uh, and we used this machine in order to simulate with the help of uh, the omnis based simulator the next generation machines so 
Uh, for my setup, I used uh, 96 computing nodes. They, they are organized in 12 drawers. We have uh, 12 terabytes of RAM in total. And basically what I did, I used um, uh, our Venus network simulator is built on top of Omnest. And I used uh, bus scripts mainly in order to schedule everything across these nodes. It's uh, an SSH cluster, uh, which has the um, uh, uh, cert file system. So it was not uh, really that difficult. I had only to do the installation once and then the installation was uh, accessible throughout the nodes. And um, from the system setup details to the simulation configuration, we used synthetic traffic patterns. Here you can see uh, four of these traffic patterns, uh, which uh, also have hotspots. And what you see here is on the x-axis, we have the source uh, node ID, the transmitter ID. On the y-axis, we have the destination ID. So as you can see, we are talking about very big systems, uh, 12,000 uh, nodes and points that need to be simulated. And here you can see the details about the traffic generators, uh, geometric uh, inter-arrival distribution, uh, the network interface cards have megabyte for the buffer size, 100 nanoseconds for the delay. Uh, for the switches, a few details. We used uh, a model that uh, simulates input buffers uh, with a certain virtual output queues. So for each input port, we have a physical buffer being simulated. And for every output, we have virtual output queues that collect the packets uh, for that particular output. For the flow control mechanism, you, you, we used a credit-based solution. And for routing, you, we used random routing, a similar solution to ECMP, equal cost multipathing. And buffer size uh, was set equal to 128 kilobytes per port. And the delay of the switch is equal to 100 nanoseconds. Uh, so here you can see uh, the simulation results. And we have three different cases. So the baseline is the, um, the system I explained earlier, which was inspired by the Summit supercomputer. And then we have uh, the system with co-packaged optics and we consider two different cases, one with 100 G links, just to see uh, the differences uh, that are coming from the architectural um, uh, advancements we did in the system. And then we increased also the data rate to see the improvements coming from uh, the higher uh, link rate. So as you can see here on the top, we have the mean server throughput versus load for all the um, cases. We have linear throughput increase. Of course, the rate becomes lower after the saturation points because we have hotspots. And uh, what we can see here is that uh, we, uh, in terms of uh, absolute numbers, we have four times higher throughput uh, compared to the baseline case. And of course, to the motion case uh, with 100 G links. So we see that just by changes, the architecture doesn't improve uh, throughput. We need also to improve the link rate. But going to the mean packet delay results here, you can see the mean packet delay on the Y axis, load again on the uh, x-axis, we see that we have improvements uh, both coming from the architecture itself, uh, up to 36% uh, improvement, and then uh, if we account also the data rate increase, the improvements can go all the way up to 71%. And of course, there is also a caveat in these results. Uh, in these results I presented, I assume that I have a, per a perfect congestion management uh, scheme implemented in the network. But if for some reason you don't have this, uh, we also simulated that case. And you can see that um, um, the proposed architecture th with the lower uh, number of layers, it is more resistant uh, to congestion. And actually, it manages to deliver a better throughput throughout uh, the complete load range, while the baseline case basically flats out uh, beyond the 0 0.3 load. Um, and going to, to the next part, uh, where we have the job placement analysis with the virtual machine traces. Uh, so a very simplistic example, just to, to give you an idea what we are trying to simulate. Let's say you have a job and you want to run it on the cloud. What you usually do, you go and you rent uh, uh, a number of virtual machines. And these virtual machines are allocated into different servers in the data center. And the way that these uh, virtual machines are placed 
um, is determined by the placement algorithm. So, for example, one placement algorithm that favors locality is like uh, you have this job A, five virtual machines, all the VMs are placed in the same rack. So we have a cost of one hop max for the communication and we don't need to cross the spine of the network. Uh, on the other side, if we have a solution that doesn't take into account uh, um, locality, maybe the VMs are spread all over your system. And the disadvantage with this approach is now we have to cross the spine. The communication cost between the VMs is uh, three hops maximum. And this can slow down the performance of your application. And in order to see how it works in these kind of systems, um, we used the Cloud Simpla simulator first, and we extended it, and we added support for um, the publicly available Azure Traces for Packing dataset. And essentially what we did, we used this dataset, and we tried to extract uh, virtual machine group requests for HPC application over a seven-day period. So what we found in the data set is that we have 630 uh, requests of this kind. And here you can see the inter-arrival times so on average one request per 14 minutes. And here are the lifetimes of the requests. So on average, we had uh, 1.5 days. Uh, for its application. And for the server configuration, we assume that we have 48 cores per server, 384 gigabytes of RAM, and different interfaces to consider for the baseline and the co-packaged optics case. And here you can see also a distribution of this um, big HPC requests according to this, their size. Uh, the majority of them is um, between uh, 48 and 50 number of VMs, and then we have also these other requests here. And here are the simulation results. Uh, the first two graphs are uh, from CloudSim uh, Plus, and then the others, uh, the, the, the one in figure C, are coming from Omnet Plus uh, for the Omnet-based simulation, and I'm going to explain uh, later what it shows. So the first thing that we did was not even the simulation was to study in a theoretical level uh, what would look like an ideal placement of the request. So we, what we said is that we'd like ideally to place the request in the the requests in the minimum number of servers to favor network locality. So if we assume that we have infinite amount of resources and no congestion in the system. This is how the placements uh, look like. This is the number of requests in uh, the percentage, and here you have the number of top of rack switches. So for the motion case, uh, most of the requests can be placed actually under uh, one switch. Uh, however, for the baseline, only 5% of the requests can be placed under one first level switch, and most of them they need to be placed into two switches which uh, will hurt the performance. Now comparing these uh, theoretical results to the simulation results, uh, here um, we have a topology aware, uh, topology aware algorithm that we considered in the analysis, and we see that for both systems we have a 20% uh, uh, re rejection ratio, which means that there was not enough capacity actually in the system for uh, the trace that we used. So these requests were rejected. And then for the remaining of the requests, we see similar performance. We see that for motion, most of the requests are placed in one top of rack switch. Uh, however, for the baseline case, we need two top of rack switches or more. Um, and then What's the difference? We, what we would like to do was to give an answer of how how can it um, affect the performance placing a request in multiple VMs. So we used again um, our simulator and uh, as a benchmark we, we used uh, an all-to-all -all traffic pattern and we played with the message size as you can see on the y-axis and we compared um, the um, the placements, uh, here we have the number of uh, switches that we used the for the placement, and we compare it co against the uh, case where we place everything in one switch. So we see that as we increase the number of switches and uh, we play with the message size, the communication time increase ranges between 4 to 68%. And 
because uh, when we have big message sizes, it's like just streaming data. That's why we are not so much affected. The increase is only 4%. But when you take the effort to transmit a small piece of information in an all-to-all -all communication, we see that it plays a really important role to have network locality and everything to be placed um, in a single uh, switch. Uh, so yeah, the higher addict switches can definitely become a game changers. Uh, in this type of applications. And now to, to summarize, we have seen that co-packaged optics can help in continuing the bandwidth scaling in future systems, uh, considering both HPC and data center applications. Uh, the advantages in the network is that we can have simpler networks with fewer switches, uh, higher bisection bandwidth, reduced switch count, which makes um, the management and the administration of the system much easier and we can have improved, ne improved network locality properties uh, overall. Uh, now, of course, these advantages uh, that we studied for the switches can be transferred also to different parts of the system, like the network interface cards or the CPUs and GPUs. And you can use this uh, technology to build um, uh, different architecture, but uh, we need more research to be done in these areas. And with that i would like to to thank you for your time and um, if you have any questions please uh, i'm uh, i'm here i'm all ears yes thank you very much i think it was very Fascinating to have a look into the like top of the class industrial research that you've shown us. That was some weird magic, really. Yes, <laughs> uh, I also wanted to add that I don't have a question because all of this is basically a bit over my head, but I am amazed by how. Mm -hmm proper high-tech stuff this is yeah thank you the, the thing is that with this kind of projects uh at some point you need to understand all the different layers of the system you need to go all the way down to see the improvements that you can get from the actual hardware like the laser and then you need to understand also the different tricks like how the protocol works or the buffers in the suites and how you solve congestion which is a whole different story by itself and at the end of the day you need to simplify everything uh like i tried to do today in order to give an an overall picture but if you have more questions or uh, are interested in uh, uh, more particular areas or even in the models uh, i know that uh, there are even more details i can share uh, mm -hmm. if you'd like so please uh, don't hesitate and contact me uh, in order to discuss further I think we have a, a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, two, in fact. Two already, OK. So no, this, uh, these synthetic traffic patterns, I, I implemented them by myself in the simulator. Uh, I'm not sure if they are available in the um, INET framework, but uh, uh, these ones are, uh, let's say, the most commonly available uh, in the literature. If you try to look into textbooks or, um, uh, you know, other papers in the literature, uh, there is a, a set of standard benchmarks that they're used for this kind of applications. And they, let's say, they represent uh, typical HPC applications like uh, fast Fourier transformation, or uh, fluid dynamics. I know some of them, uh, they are coming from this area. Uh, so yeah, if you are interested, I can give you some references on that. Let, let me write my email. I don't think I, uh, I can write my email in the chat. And if people need some references, I can, they can send me an email and I can reply. Thank you. Uh, and the first message was uh, also a question about post. Uh, 
is it cheaper to have the optics clustered? So, uh, what do we mean uh, by clustered? I'm not sure I'm uh, I am understanding this uh, this part. In, in the cluster, that does it mean in the cluster? Do they mean maybe co-packaged? Yeah. So the thing is that um, let me go back to to this slide. Here, uh, so uh, there are only ways to estimate now the cost, really, because we haven't built a system. Uh, at least uh, on the IBM research side, we, we, uh, side, we are not building these switches, but rather we are focusing on the optics module. But from the estimations that we have seen in other publications and uh, uh, the calculations we did inside, uh, there is an overall, let's say, 50% reduction in the cost that you can get compared to the plugable optics. Uh, if you try to compare uh, uh, the same system, right? You want to build a 51.2 terabps suites. So comparing uh, the standard approach versus the co-packaged optics approach and focusing only on the interface, what we see is like a 50% reduction in the cost. If you look at it from a, an overall perspective, like what you have in the box for cooling and everything, uh, people are rather talking uh, more or less uh, uh, for about 30% reduction in the cost. And there was recently also a presentation for, from Broadcom. They were talking about their solution uh, on co-packaged optics and switches. They, they built these switches so they have better insights, for, that's for sure. And yeah, this is the number they mentioned, 30% for the whole box, 50% for, uh, for the interface itself. Either way, that's significant, I think. Yeah, yeah, and that's the main um, motivation. At some point, you need also to cool these things down. And as you add more and more uh, uh, lanes, certain lanes and pluggable modules, it's just becoming so difficult to get the heat out of the, of the box. That's interesting because what you mentioned on your slides, it, it uh, occurred to me that the power consumption was not much lower. Obviously, so like for double the throughput, you got about double uh, the consumption as well. So there was not a 30% reduction, at least if I understood it right, uh, from consumption. Uh, oh. No, for consumption, it is indeed uh, lower. And the reason is just you don't need to drive. So the, everything comes down to the serders lanes, the interface. So in, uh, imagine that these wires here inside the motherboard are several inches, uh, like, I don't know, maybe 10 inches long or 20 inches, uh, depending on the configuration. And as you increase the length, you need more power to drive the optics. And because now you place them just next to the ASIC is just a few millimeters or centimeters, uh, you, you can uh, literally save down all that power. And imagine mm. also one, uh, one, else, uh, one different perspective of this problem is like uh, people, they have this conception that we use now optics everywhere and in HPCs and data centers, but what really happens uh let's uh, let's go to this schematic for example people use optics but they use them between the switches not so much between the top of rack switch and the servers so you still have uh today you still have um copper cables coming from the switches to the servers which all comes down again if we go back uh, to this schematic you you now need enough power to drive copper cables to go all the way to the uh, port here which is now copper for this case can and you see that because i can't see it right now uh, your screen share flows i think at least for me yeah probably uh you can see my screen N well we can well, see a previous version of it i guess so <laughs> maybe stuck. if you could restart restart the screen share uh let me see stop and start again uh, stop and how about now? 
Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Much better. So what I was trying to explain is that um, people they have today the misconception that we replaced everything with optics, which is not true. A lot of uh, times these connections between the top of rack switches and the servers are in fact electrical connections. And mm -hmm. even in the Summit supercomputer, for example, uh, when it was built back in 2017, I think, uh, they used electrical wires just because these wires were cheaper at the time. And uh, the thing is that in order to drive these wires, they are like two meters long or three meters long, you need uh, a lot of power coming out from your uh, serders lanes, which are uh, which are placed uh, on the ASIC. So now mm -hmm. imagine moving to this approach with the co-package optics, you need just enough power to drive this module here, just a little bit of electricity. And then here you have the laser uh, transmits light, which uh, has uh, less losses uh, when you transmit this. These links can be up to 30 meters, for example, mm -hmm. that we, we are implementing in the project. So you can literally save uh, this amount of energy just from uh, just from this difference um, if you if you build a hybrid solution let's say like you have also co-package optics and you have also plugable modules like traditionally you only get half of the savings let's say because mm -hmm. part of your ports are coming from here the other half is like traditional mm -hmm. that's amazing yeah when I first uh, seen the uh, like 51 terabit per second, I was like, after a while, one stops calculating how many HD movies per second you can transfer <laughs> over a wire like this, or a connection like this. But uh, then uh, one can hear that if you are training very large uh, neural networks, and uh, that network doesn't fit into one NVIDIA A1 chip, Exactly. Then, then during some of these trainings, like the chips can be idle like 90% of the time because after some training phases, you have to stop and the chips have to reconcile some data. And only after that, they can resume training. So that means that overall, like the, the chips are 90% idle. So that means that you do have actually a big need for, for quite a lot of bandwidth between these chips. So, so this is what, like, you, we can hear about the Tesla Dojo supercomputer, which is where the revolution is that they they made the interconnection bandwidth much higher between the D1 chips. So that's why how they can achieve larger performance that because they can they can keep the compute units busy. They don't have to wait for each other for the communication to finish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And and one other aspect of this is that not only you have this high demand for bandwidth and low latency, uh, the thing is that also the behavior of the system is uh, much different. In traditional applications, we were used like to more contact system for a certain period of time, of course, and you had some time to react, let's say, I have some time to detect congestion and maybe take clever decision or how to reroute everything. But now if you have, um, in these cases like AI and machine learning uh, training applications, uh, everything is quiet in the network. And then you have boom, an explosion, like everybody's trying to communicate with everybody else. And all the queues are uh, suddenly saturated. And there is not much you can do there to, there are not uh, more paths to route uh, your packets. So essentially what you need to do is to just build um, higher bandwidth switches that can handle all these requests. And is this the final frontier? So anything beyond optics? Can you see anything uh, replacing optics? Because I mean, the growth in uh, in bandwidth and data hunger is is incredible now. I don't think I have a a good answer to that one. I, I believe uh, adoption, further adoption of optics, is the next step that will keep uh, coming for the next few years, 
and there is a lot more work that we can done we can do in that area Mm -hmm. But for, for other solutions, I'm not sure, even even in, let's say, I don't know, I'm not the expert in these areas, but even in uh, quantum computers and different systems, what I'm hearing, they are also trying to, to see how they can use optics more efficiently for communication between the, uh, the processors or the computers. Yeah, I'm sure the, there's a lot of uh, other things you can do, like, uh, I don't know, optimize the materials, the the wavelength stuff like that probably yeah 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 inside the the optics area itself yeah of course more efficient layers the uh, lasers they always try to to improve uh, energy consumption footprint as well you need to be really uh, small and uh, to dissipate uh, less heat so it's easier for uh, to to pack a lot of these modules inside the same box and uh, staying with uh, optics, uh, do you think that perhaps the next step in integration could be like uh, on silicon optics? Or given that even like the modern uh, PC processors are being split into multiple triplets, then that doesn't make sense because once you are on the same package, multiple silicon pieces just are, are good enough yeah that's true this is also a very hot topic okay okay well every good thing has an end so i guess we've come up to uh the end of the ninth omnet summit uh it was really really great having you people here and uh I'd really like to thank everybody who who uh, took the time to present here and develop presentation. And we have Rudy back, which is great. Yeah. So Hi. still from mobile. Really? Oh, OK. It's the best time for the audio system to die. Yeah. So party time we're done uh, um i think um andres could you press the recording button please yeah we'll, we'll we'll have to cut something out of this although it was a long question and answer session